Drones have really changed how we view the world. It brings aerial photography and videography to the masses. And previously, what could only be captured by helicopter or plane can now be viewed by drone. For construction projects, this kind of insight can be critical. And we're going to talk with a company that specializes in making this happen. So stay tuned. Everybody, this is Chris Brandt here with Sundish Patel. Welcome to another future podcast. Today we have with us Rory San Miguel, co-founder and CEO of Propeller Aero, which provides 3D drone-based analysis to reliably map, measure, and report on worksite progress. And this is an incredibly valuable tool for worksites to manage progress, maintain safety, and prevent disasters. So we're going to talk with Rory about how this all works and why it is so important. Welcome, Rory. Thanks for having me, Chris. Well, thanks for being on. I uh, I got to admit, I'm a big fan of uh, aerial videography and photography. I I'm in the uh, you know under 249 grams category, but you know uh, <laughs> it's 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 a ton of a ton of fun, and uh, I can see the in incredible value that you know having drones uh, to do this kind of work can provide. But before we get into that. Can you just tell me a little bit about, you know, like what was the idea behind starting the company, how you got to here, you know, what was, what was the founder story? My background is in robotics. I was studying uh, how to build and sort of configure robots at university. And in 2012, 2013, me and a couple of buddies got together and started uh, buying lots of small electronic components and selling them to students on campus where we went to university in Sydney. As you can tell, I'm Australian. Um, now, this club uh, ended up becoming a bit of a maker's club, you know, so helping people build these small robots and, and use the components that, that, that we were selling them. And one thing led to another, and we ended up kind of making a bit of money inside this club and not knowing really what to do with it. So I ended up picking drones as a sort of area of interest and just buying a lot of the parts that I could buy from China and, you know, on Alibaba and eBay and, and whatnot, uh, developed a passion around building and playing with drones um, and that kind of supplemented my university I would say so we were studying of course robotics on the side and then playing with them uh, on campus in our own time. I ended up working at an electrical engineering uh, startup as well at, this, at the same time you know in the lab fixing circuit boards and um, you know debugging things and I remember one day seeing across the hallway uh, in uh, through some through some glass windows there was a team in there building a drone. And I thought, wow, and this is probably two years after I'd gotten going with drones. I went and knocked on the glass window and said, what are you guys doing? Uh, you know, they said, oh, we're starting a company that's going to try and do drone delivery. And I said, okay, cool. Do you need a drone, a drone guy? Um, <laughs> and that kind of got me into the, well, it got me into startups, right? So I was already in drones and, and that got me into startups. So that was 2013, late 2013. Um, was with that company for six months and then uh, met my co-founder, Francis, uh, we ended up both leaving that business and kind of a couple of days later started Propeller. Uh, and at the time, to be honest, um, we didn't exactly know what we were going to do, but we knew that drones would have some place in the world. We knew that drones would solve some problems and we wanted to be the company that figured out at least a few of those things. And that's really what Propeller has become. So that is, that's kind of how we got going, Chris. You know, I kind of mentioned in the intro, you know, some of the uses of, of drones in, in, in particularly in construction and, you know, sort of those kinds of projects. Um, can you just tell me about like how you got to do what you do today and what kind of problems are you really tackling? I'll start off with our very first idea and I'll kind of step you through the, the iterations of the business. <laughs> the very first idea was to build a drone and that drone would be a little bit special, not too special. It, it was going to uh, take photos and then upload those photos over a 4G network while it was flying. That's all it was going to do. And then at the same time, build some software that could take those photos in and stitch them into a big 3D map. Now, that was kind of the hardware and the software side of Propeller. It suited my strengths and my co-founder strengths, etc. Now, pretty quickly, we realized um, building a drone was not necessary, uh, which is disappointing to me because I was the drone guy. Uh, <laughs> We ended up doubling down on the software platform to take those photos, process them, and then help customers analyze the, the maps that were created. Um, so that really became kind of the first product of sorts of the business. Now, we started researching, and this became my job, where, you know, who needs maps of their, of their land? And who needs regular maps? Um, who needs maps that are in high resolution? And we ended up finding and talking to a bunch of quarries, right? And quarries kind of 
around the urban rim, lots of sand and gravel, stones, road base, all of those materials are produced in quarries. And uh, we talked to a quarry and we went out to the site and we said, hey, do you get aerial surveys? Do you get aerial maps? And they said, yes, we pay $7,000 every six months to have a plane fly over our site and take a photo. <laughs> we thought, great, we'll do that for half the price and we'll do it with the drone. And, and so more we did often, it. do it more often too, right? And do it more often. Yeah. Um, we did it. Now, there was one kind of gotcha and this is kind of, we go into some technicals here, but you know, it's pretty easy to actually stitch a map together, stitch all these images into a map. What's hard is to get that map accurately located so that you can use the data in 3D to actually measure, right? And so in order to do that, you end up going to onto the site and painting these crosses all across the site, these white crosses. And then in the photos, you see those white crosses and you kind of pin that map down to the ground. Now, we were told those white crosses existed on the site. They didn't exist. So we got the photos from the drone. We were looking for those white crosses. And we couldn't see them anywhere, which meant, unfortunately, we could only produce an inaccurate map. And that, that triggered us to solve the problem of accuracy in drone data. And so we came up with a new product, the AeroPoints, which is a hardware product. I was happy because I got to do some hardware again. Um, and so from that moment, and this is, you know, 2015, 2016, Propeller had a software platform that processed and analyzed the drone maps and a hardware product that made any drone map highly accurate. Uh, and that's kind of been the foundation, I suppose, of the business. And therefore, today, you know, Propeller, thousands of sites every month that need accurate drone maps or accurate maps, really, are using our products to map their site and start measuring how much dirt have they moved, how much do they need to move, um, how fast are they moving dirt? Are they on track? Kind of answering those basic progress and productivity questions, um, you know, if you're a site with lots of big earth moving machines. So, you know, construction and earth moving is sort of a, a, a big, big one for you guys. And I know like, you know, you can, you can sort of evaluate, you know, the, the the progress of a construction project, but you you know, you're, you're also like you mentioned you're you're evaluating the surfaces that people are building on and and how that all works out. And I know like one of the things that's like really critical for some of these construction projects is sort of like where does all the water go, right? Can you talk about totally. like the flood mapping and and how you how you handle that stuff? It's a really it's a really good point, but ultimately our customers are these large, you know, dirt sites. Okay, there's just huge expanse of dirt, and they're often trying to reshape the terrain for one reason or another. So they're right. building a subdivision or a new highway. Now, if you're a quarry, for example, like we were just talking about, you're actually digging all this gravel out of the ground, you're making a big hole. And what's going to happen when it rains is all of that water is going to get captured. And if you've got expensive equipment in the bottom of the pit, it could turn into literally a swimming pool. <laughs> and so water management is a really important problem our customers face across the board, right? Even if you're building a highway, you know, I don't know if you've ever noticed how subtly sloped the highway is away from the center of the road. All of this is designed to ensure that the water moves in a predictable way and it's actually really intentional. Now, it's kind of easy to design the right water management at the end of the project or sort of, you know, when the road's finished. What do, what do you do when you're actually constructing, you know, the ground is open and it could turn into mud and it could slow down work. And so we've built a bunch of tools that help our customers, you know, visualize where water will run across the site. And you're able to do that fairly easily once you've got a really accurate 3D map of the site. So if you can imagine a, um, it, it almost looks like a, you know, a big dirt site, a big quarry, for example, with all these blue lines of uh, spaghettis kind of flowing across the site. <laughs> and really quickly, our customers can see, great, the water's going to pull here. And so how are we going to deal with the water that's pulling there? Should we get a pump? Should we divert the water elsewhere? And these are some of the sort of tangible little bits of ROI that, that, that again, high quality aerial maps just unlock downstream for those customers. Yeah, I got to imagine, you know, a lot of that too helps with safety. Because I mean, I got to imagine job site safety mm -hmm. is dependent on a lot of things. I mean, sort of like, you know, certain elevations, are they prone to, you know, collapse walls, exactly. collapse on people or, or water? And what's going to happen? Is that angle going to be enough to support what's going on? All those types of things. I, is there, I, there must be a huge safety element in all of this too, right? It's a massive safety element. I mean, there's multiple dams, right, have had their, their some of their tailings dams, so where they store a lot of the um, sort of byproducts of the mining process, those tailings dams, tailings dams break and flood small villages in Brazil and, kind of, you know, many people have died over poor water management practices in these industries. 
So it is really serious. And um, yeah, we think that, again, trying to help our customers understand the limits of the, the dirt, right? We're, how much water can that area take safely? Um, when should you expect a spill? Like these are the things that, again, you can just really simply answer with 3D data. So, yeah, look, we didn't ever expect at the start of Propeller to be solving these problems, but <laughs> as the in, in the way that it does, you know, you twist and you turn and you, you're just looking for problems to help our customers with, and, and that's where things end up um, going. With some of the, the technology that you guys have built and some of the things you're doing, I, I kind of imagine, you know, there's going to be people coming knocking on your door, you know, like in the insurance business or in, you know, the, you know, I mean, obviously in the construction business, but, you know, home builders and things like that. I mean, you know, they must be coming to you to say like, hey, let's let's survey this site. If the water table rises X amount, what's going to happen to all this? And I mean, there's especially with, you know, global warming and rising sea levels and all of those things. Um, I got to imagine there's a lot of, you know, interesting use cases for that, right? What you're talking about there is just how broadly applicable I think aerial maps are to yeah. a lot of decisions we make as a society. Um, and then drones are, of course, an easy way to get aerial maps, and that's what's changed in the last five years. You know, They're just so much more accessible than ever before. It, for us, though, as a business, it's been a really important decision to choose what industries to focus on. And Propeller did start as you know, technology looking for a problem, right? We didn't know construction, we knew drones. Um, and so for, for a bunch of reasons, we've whiplashed, I would say, <laughs> and now we're firmly focused on construction and related earth-moving industries. Uh, and we'll, we'll build any product, I suppose, or we'll build a certain class of products, whether or not they're drone-related or not, for those customers. So as a company, we've actually tried to really stay customer-oriented um, and therefore, we haven't, we've explicitly chosen not to focus on insurance or not to kind of branch out from those classic earth moving use cases. We think there's a huge opportunity just to double down um, in this space and focus being, you know, one of those critical uh, unblockers and, and, and things that helps companies scale and grow. So many of these infrastructure projects are so massive and so expensive. So huge. And, and just, you know, like solving some of these little problems, even just understanding how much progress has been made, you know, like where to move the equipment to next and, you know, who, how many people to bring and, you know, all that I would imagine is really, you know, things that you can help with figuring out, right? Many companies, you know, will talk about the size of the industry they're targeting, right? $5 billion, $10 billion, whatever <laughs> it is. And, you know, for us, as you said, some of these projects are $5 billion, single project. Right, We're, Sydney's building a new airport right, right now, which is worth at least that much money. So, I think the reason to branch out into other industries would be if the market was too small in the one that we were most <laughs> comfortable with. Now, if we can prove that the market isn't too small, let's go. Let's just double down and stay focused because we you know we see compounding acceleration as a result. Um, so, all of our team gets comfortable and familiar with the industry, and our pricing makes sense and. You know, the features that we're building for one customer are exactly what another customer needs as well. So all of this kind of, the, the, as much overlap as we can find as a business, I really think that um, takes all of that distraction and uh, kind of, yeah, gets in the way of progress, I would say. For a company that's not a massive, massive, you know, global conglomerate, you know, like staying focused on your core customer base and, and, and really finding, you know, your sweet spot in the market and, and focusing on that is is a good way to grow. It's critical. It's critical. Especially when you're starting a business, you know, with, with, the, with solutions looking for problems. Yes. Well, you're, you're, it's a good thing you found, found, uh, you know, some problems to solve for because, and, 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 and like you, you mentioned that the TAM of infrastructure is just it's crazy. Massive. I mean, it's massive government expenditure product projects, right? Exactly. The U S government's trying to spend a trillion dollars on infrastructure across the country. I mean, you don't need a bigger industry than that. Like, that's it. That's as good as it gets. <laughs> that, I mean, that'll do. <laughs> feeding people is the is is bigger, but that's that's you know, this is number two. So, tell me a little bit about how it works. I I, I know, like, I mean, everybody's sort of familiar with GPS, mm -hmm. right? And 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 you guys 
are using, you know, these, these pads to, you know, like really help refine the location data and all that. But I mean, you get, you, you, you're, you says you're, um, you're accurate to one tenth of a foot or three centimeters. Can you sure. talk about how you get that kind of fidelity out of your maps? So GPS, right? You've just touched on it. There's, there's really two types of GPS processing methodologies. The first is what your phone uses and you get, you know, 10 feet ish, the blue ring around yourself on Google Maps. That's, that's how good a phone can, can position you. And that's pretty good, right? This is coming from space, these signals, and they're working through trees and whatever. It's, it's remarkable. I think the whole stack, how, how it works. Yeah. Now there's an alternative processing method, uh, in the world of GPS that allows you to essentially compare the position of two points. So you've got what's called a base and the base is in a static position. The base knows exactly where it is. And then you've got a rover, and the rover is the thing that's moving around. And in our case, it's the drone or the arrow points. Now, the way it works really, uh, and to summarize, is you're figuring out the error on the base, and then you're moving the error, you're, you're pasting the error over the positions that the rover is getting. And by doing that, that, you end up with a very relatively accurate position down to about two or three centimeters or a tenth of a foot. So Propeller has expertise and experts in that special type of processing of GPS and our error points, those targets that you mentioned, those rely on the same technique and those end up being a base station for the drone that's flying around the site. So we've essentially built this fairly complicated GPS workflow for the field, in the field, to make it really easy to get accurate data. Um, that's, that's the first half. The second half is quite simple, which is that the error points themselves these targets, these pads that, that people buy and use, they've got a big checkerboard on them, okay? And right at the middle of the checkerboard is our GPS unit. And so instead of needing to go out to a site like we talked about at the beginning and paint white crosses on the ground and then get the X, Y, Z coordinate, now all you need to do is throw an arrow point on the ground, turn it on, which is a single button operation, and it sits there and figures out its own position, right? And that checkerboard is visible in the images. So once we're looking at the images at the end of the survey, someone's uploaded them to Propeller, we can see them all and we can see where our error points are. Those checkerboards are in the photos. We take the coordinate, we pin it to it, and that starts to lock the model to the ground. So that's those are the two ingredients. It's the complicated GPS processing methods that we use and the error points being physically on the ground and visible in the photos that allows Propeller to get really good quality maps, really consistent, really accurate. And that's what I suppose our, our company has become known for. That's what our customers love most about the business. That's an interesting solution to the problem because, you know, I would have thought like, well, let's modify the GPS on the drones and let's do this and do that. Uh, but instead, you're, you know, that, that I imagine helps you, uh, enables you to um, just use kind of off the shelf drone technology rather than exactly. like super modified, you know, military spec kind of drones to, to get this kind of accuracy, right? That's exactly right. So, so Propeller works with any drone and the arrow points work with any drone. Um, we have enhanced the workflows over the years to make them more compatible with some drones where we can get even better accuracies. So for us, it's kind of this pursuit of accuracy, right? Lots of little, you know, knobs and dials being um, tweaked, but essentially... Yeah, you're exactly right. We get to use off-the-shelf drones. It's a really simple workflow for people in the field. Um, and just quickly, even if you were to get the most complicated drone on the market and fly it through the air with the most precise GPS on it, because you're flying through the air and you've got a camera on board and it's taking photos as it's flying, and it might be flying 20 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour through the sky, there are still always errors that exist mm -hmm. right? as you try and fit all of those images together. And so our error points, having something physical on the ground kind of is that last closing of all of the last bits of error, kind of wraps it all up and says, great, here's the ground, we can see it. And that tightens the model to that to that really good standard. I understand how you're doing it, you know, sort of for the, the cardinal directions, but you're doing it three-dimensionally, right? So you're getting Correct. elevations. How do you get the elevation so accurate? It's a process called photogrammetry, which is a word that not many people can spell. And the <laughs> way photogrammetry works, it's a bit like your eyes, right? Where we can see in 3D because we've got two eyes and our brain can interpret the angles and, you know, figure out distance from the head. Now, in a drone, you don't have two eyes. You've got one eye. But the drone is able to move the eye. So what's right. happening is the drone's flying in these lawnmower-style grids, 
capturing lots of photos from different perspectives of the th- same things on the ground. And we're essentially using similar um, calculations to how the brain works to figure out from this position, I could see that you know car here. From this position, I could see the car here. Therefore, I can you know run the the maths and figure out what the height is um, from the drone to the ground. And then, of course, we've got GPS positions on the drone, the arrow points. All of these systems work together to produce X, Y, Z positions that are you know within two or three centimeters. So it is remarkable. We, you know, I gave a presentation to the team a few years ago, which is essentially laying out the the plumbing of this whole stack. And you've got satellites flying through space. You've got robots flying above work sites at 20, 30 miles an hour. You've got GPS targets on the ground. Everything's kind of, all of this stuff is going on. It's all wirelessly being transmitted. And then magically you end up with a 3D model of the site that's geospatially accurate to within a tenth of a foot. It's it's mind-blowing. I mean, just GPS alone is fascinating because, I mean, it, 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 it relies on, you know, like special relativity just to keep things accurate, you know? It's it's all, yeah, exactly. I mean, the way the way your phone works is pretty remarkable as well, right? Because you're getting these signals and it's set, it's, there's a timestamp in the GPS signal. The phone's seeing that signal at a certain time. So it knows how long that signal's taken to get to you. It's getting that from multiple GPS satellites at the same time, and it's comparing all these times and using that to figure out distance because you've got, of course, radio waves traveling through the atmosphere. Anyway, all of that gets wrapped up and you drive along the highway and it gives you directions. Like, it is remarkable. Can you actually see these images then from your iPhone? Like, can can you just send it to someone or can can somebody just download it like right yeah, away? Totally, yeah. You end up with, um, you know, shareable map links that are all high resolution and in the browser. Because I would think the images are so big. We stream yeah. everything, right? You don't want to be downloading any of these maps. It's a, a single site could be a 20 gigabyte photo, right? You do wow. not want to be touching that in, in sort of a desktop environment. So it's all tiled and it's all streamed and it's, you know, it's kind of like using Google Maps on steroids. You can load those straight into like AutoCAD and things like that with all the metadata necessary to get the all positioning the right. Exactly. You know, you have your building plans and then you could just overlay the reality on your CAD files to see like how things are progressing. That's got to be a really wow. cool view. I, I was talking to one of our sales guys today about a customer use case that was exactly that. Um, they were building a, a big, big building and each, each, um, each level, of course, they're laying more concrete. And inside the concrete, they're putting rebar and they're putting lift shafts and all these utilities and things and what they they had a plan a, a you know cad plan of what where all those services needed to be laid and what they did was they put them all down before they laid the concrete got the drone up flew got the map it was highly accurate so they can see they can compare is that rebar and those services and utilities exactly where they need to be they realized some were off they were able to fix it and then pour the concrete you can imagine the old way is literally pouring the concrete whoops Lift shaft can't go through, jackhammer, 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 go again. And so apparently the first time this customer used us, they saved $7,000 just in rework, the very first map they produced. And I mean, to put that in perspective, it costs about $12,000 a year to use our software. So you're paying twelve grand a year, the very first time you use it, you're, you're finding $7,000. And this is, you know, this is a customer that they're not trying to spend check very easily how much money we're making them. Like everyone's kind of cagey about these ROIs. And so it was at that level of legitimacy for them to uh, let us know and, and say that they're, you know, very happy with the level of accuracy they're getting because it allowed them to do that and and avoid the rework. What is the culture like of a, of a company like yours, uh, a drone company slash, you know, uh, I don't know, 3D imaging, et cetera? If you can imagine 180 <laughs> people who are all map nerds we love we literally love maps with a whole bunch of maps <laughs> and you know it's maps and it's robots and it's dry like it's all of these things and they're they're kind of the the glue at the heart of it all is this geospatial data that we're, we've become very good at as a business um so if you throw anyone in anyone at propeller in a random city with a map like they'll be fine you know <laughs> yeah. um <laughs> Yeah, I, that's probably it to summarize the culture. That's what it's <laughs> Yeah, like. that's great. How are you finding your talent? 
we literally say we're map nerds. Come and join us if you're a map nerd. You know? So, like anybody That's watching, if, you, if you're a map nerd, and I'm sure there's there's some of them out there. Uh, you know, come and come some talk people, to the people. Some people really love maps, right? They color them, they put them on the wall, they 3D print them, they you know cut cut them out, laser cut them out of plywood, and stack them up to build the elevations. There's a lot of sort of obscure <laughs> mapping passions that are out there and a bunch of them a bunch of them uh live and work at propeller that's amazing and there's 180 of you it's huge yeah we're almost 200 that's a lot of map nerds <laughs> and i find i mean I, th I think that stuff is fascinating too i mean it's like you yeah. know like even just you know there's so much to it right you know being a map nerd there's the sort of the geopolitical map side of it you know like i have an old map from 1929 that's just like all the countries are different you know totally. it's cool. super cool and have you seen those have you seen those photos where it compares the size of the country in real life compared to the size of the yes. country on the map right because maps yes. don't always tell the truth there's this interpretation as well and yeah. so we're experts at that um that translation of, of things depending on where they are on the globe and and all of that um and it's not that surprising when i was a kid you know we did a family trip in italy must have been 2001. And I was the guy that was directing it. I like, you know, <laughs> mom and dad are like, come on, show us where to go. And so I'm sitting there kind of running the family holiday from these maps. And it's just been more and more of that. So I got a question for you. Do you ever ask for directions? I do use Google Maps <laughs> often. Um, I use it in, I'm, I'm, you know, often in new cities I've never been to and whatnot. But I know that as soon as I need to learn, if I, if I want to actually get serious about the layout of a city, I just put map put Google Maps away, spend a minute looking at where I'm trying to get and where I am, get a sense of, you know, what the overall bearing is, right? How many lefts, how many rights, how, how much straight, and then remember a few key street names near where I'm trying to get and then just drive until I find it. So that's my <laughs> learning method if I've got time. If I don't have time, it's like get Google Maps on and, you know, reduce the chance of error. See, I, I, I've, I have your method as well. And my, my wife calls me long way brand because I'm, I'm like, you know, I may not get there the, the, the straightest path, but I always go the most interesting way. <laughs> yeah. And you learn that way. You don't learn. Google Maps is like your, your actual brain shuts down. It is sort of the, the, the era of post-humanism where we actually, you know, we talk about these human computer brain interfaces. We've, we're already there. I mean, Google is that computer brain interface. We're the robot. Yeah. Google's the brain. I yeah. often question whether or not we are in servitude to the machines or the machines are in servitude to us. Because we spend a lot of time fixing, repairing, maintaining, caring for them. You know, I'm not sure who's the cattle. I remember a friend of mine said to me years and years ago, I, I don't use phone cases. And I was like, why is that? And he said, because the phone serves me, I don't serve the phone. <laughs> and it was such a weird phrase, but I think it is what you're talking about here. I think uh, we are the keepers of this brave new world, not not necessarily the main participants. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you have some really interesting, you know, customer case stories out of all this. I mean, could you share a couple stories of, of customers that, you know, have done really interesting things? We had one not long ago where it was a road being built. And the way these roads are built, of course, uh, there's a design, a three-dimensional design that's produced in CAD. That design is then loaded into the machines and the machines can do a certain amount of autonomous work, right? They're not, they're not moving themselves, but they are able to control the blade. So if you're a dozer, you're pushing how high is the blade, what angle, etc. That can be controlled by the design itself. Wow. Now, the dozer, well, the fleet of machines, there was a calibration issue, uh, which was producing a 500 mil, so half a meter what's that, um, three feet, one and a half foot, right? Almost two feet uh, error to the left. And so this road has been being built for about 500 meters, uh, almost half a mile, 500 mils or half a meter to the left of where it was meant to be. Mm. And of course, they were going on for days, feeling like they were doing a good job. And then they flew the drone and they had the same design in Propeller, in our software. And then they can compare where they are at compared to the design and they saw everything was shifted. And they thought initially it was our system that was wrong. So they actually <laughs> called us and got quite angry. They're like, you guys say you're accurate. What's going on? You know, <laughs> you can't be doing this. And one of our map nerds, of course, dived in, in a way that we do. We do this. And we kind of go into the nth detail. We call it millimeter madness. 
we had a look and we realized that we actually weren't wrong. Uh, and it looks like the machine calibration was wrong. And so they had to go and tear it up uh, and, and kind of get going again. So now they were obviously disappointed, but they were, it was a better outcome than having gone on for longer uh, with the same constraints. And so that, that's just another example of where small little issues can create huge problems. Um, you, you, need, you need oversight, right? You just need oversight to make sure things are going to plan. Laying down a, you know, 10 miles of road, you know, in the wrong spot is going to be really expensive. (laughs) It wasn't 10 miles. It was like a few days worth of work, but still, um, it's something to watch out for. There's, there's lots though. There's dams, there's airports, there's bridges, um, subdivisions, there's disputes that happen right between two parties and they're able to pull out the map and just say, this is what site looked like when we left, or this is what site looked like when we got here. Uh, it's that, it's just really trying to give people a source of truth, right? And it's like take some of the subjectivity away from these discussions and, and make it about the data. Are you yeah. are you putting surveyors out of work in a lot of cases? No. We work so well with surveyors and so closely with surveyors. So for, for you know, sur- surveyors and survey crews that work in construction are so busy, right, that what's happening now is they're able to delegate some of the, the easier data capture work to their teams with propeller so it's the survey crews actually get it first they test it they make sure it's accurate enough then they hand it off to the project manager or the project engineer or whoever it is that's stationed on site every day that person can go and do all the capture the technology makes it safe from an from an accuracy perspective they're not going to get it wrong um, and then the surveyors kind of act in an oversight capacity and they start doing more of the high value work that they haven't had time to to tackle so um, no propeller is best friends with survey teams and we yeah we we it's a it's it's just one of the responsibilities of survey it's a very Mm -hmm. small responsibility they've got many other things that they can focus on instead what what's next for propeller i mean you know like i I, i'm having visions of you know when you talk about the satellites talking to the ground units to the flying robots now i just envision like robotic 3d printers coming on site and printing houses and buildings and but (laughs) we're far off (laughs) <laughs> what, is, what does the future look like for you? Like I said at the start, right, we're more focused on this set of industries now than we are on drones. And we're building other products that aren't drone oriented, but obviously still take advantage of our strengths and are fun for us to do as a bunch of map nerds. And so the next the next product is a product called Dirtmate that we're working on. Dirtmate is actually taking the same GPS concepts, right, that super accurate comparative GPS that we do, and putting a unit, a solar-powered unit, on each machine. And what we're doing is as those machines move across the site and they're pushing dirt or they're digging or they're whatever they're doing, um, they're actually mapping X, Y, Z elevations in real time. So they're picking up up like a three-dimensional ribbon, right, of where that machine has been. Now, if we do that across all machines and then we stitch all of those ribbons together into one big ribbon that's made up of all of the smaller ribbons, we end up with a surface, right? And the surface is the current state of the site. And so what we're trying to do and what we are doing, what we have done is we can now produce daily and automated surfaces from our customers' work sites without them needing to fly the drone. So the drone, they might fly two times a week or once a week to get that picture, to get that oversight, close off any of the errors. But then in between that, all of these machines are actually producing equivalent data um, that we're able to analyze for our customers and then tell them, are they on track or not, without getting the, the drone out. Does that make sense? When you describe that, I almost envision, you know, some of these 3D, uh, VD, VR-based yes. rigs where you're kind of, you know, like mapping in real time where the headsets are and where everything is and and overlaying all this stuff. I mean, I could imagine a really cool someday VR representation of a, a build site where people could oh. actually, you know, especially when you're doing photogrammetry too, right? So you'd have the surface mapping, you know, so you could really integrate that with everything that's going on. That'd be so cool. We see exactly that. So all of this rich visual information is is well suited for people that aren't on the site. And so yeah. is VR, right? To get that immersed. You know, we, we know that Propeller helps our customers reduce their site visits. Um, and we think that, that VR and related technologies does play a role in the future 
in enhancing them. So cool, man. I, I envision you someday 3D printing houses on Mars. So, Well, yeah, so we've, we're definitely still focused on the, um, you know, tracking side of things, the tracking and optimization side of things rather than construction, but you never know. And, um, we're never just know. Doing, you know, how did we get here? We had no no idea at the time. So it could take that shape. You know, that would be really interesting. It, it's all really in, incredibly cool stuff. I love, you know, infrastructure kind of construction yeah. stuff. That's just, it, it's, you know, it, it's so much of the stuff that people take for granted and how much important work and, and technology and, you know, cool things have to go on behind the scenes to just so you can drive down a road. I know. <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> I, I have the same thought so often. I'm, you know, anytime there's a smooth road, just to think, the effort that went into making that smooth at 70 miles an hour, it's its not trivial. I'd never been to a quarry before. I'd never heard of a quarry before starting propeller. And quarries are everywhere, right? You, we have sand, we have gravel, we have concrete. I mean, these are, these, these are the building blocks of society um, that don't get much love from a technology perspective. So, yeah, I mean, for us, like I said, it's a bunch of map nerds that have found some really a really lovely and important space to work it's been super rewarding for the whole team well it sounds like awesome awesome fun and you know i just want to say thanks thanks for coming on and and sharing the story of your company and and about some of the cool things you're doing really appreciate you coming on i appreciate you having us thanks for watching i love to hear from you in the comments and if you like what you saw give us a like and think about subscribing and i will see you in the next video